Welcome to the eighth podcast of the Merseyside Pensioners Association, recorded on the 20th of May 2020. It's not just for pensioners, but for everyone. In today's programme, we talk to Professor John Ashton and ask him about the government's response to the pandemic. Merseyside MP Ian Byrne tells us why schools should not be reopening in line with government advice and how important food banks are to many on the breadline. We'll be listening to a socialist love song that swings called Let's Change the World That We Live In. We hope to bring you an exclusive interview with Health Secretary Matt Hancock and we will be asking Merseyside pensioner Audrey White about how truth and justice can prevail after the lockdown. Many of you will have heard of the eminent scouser Professor John Ashton. He is one of the world's leading experts on public health and was kind enough to speak to us earlier. Regular listeners will know that in the past we've requested interviews with Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, but they've declined our generous invitations to come on the podcast. Boris Johnson now wants us to stay alert. Well, many of you have written in suggesting that the school that the Prime Minister went to, Eton, should be the first school that reopens. I really wanted to alert Mr Johnson to this popular idea from our many listeners but yet again he's indisposed. John Ashton went to Quarry Bank School in Liverpool so he's not as posh as the PM but he certainly talks sense. Let me just read to you John what <laughs> Merseyside pensioner Mary Harrison wrote recently. She said Remember when Margaret Thatcher said, no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. Well, I can say society is very much a thing. I received a note through my door from a group of five young people, presumably students, given I live off Smithstown Road. These wonderful young people are offering to shop or help in any way for those who are self-isolating or living alone. They have also asked their fellow students who may be leaving Liverpool to donate any food they don't want and these young people will collect and take it to the food bank. They are wonderful and deserve recognition for their selfless act. Brilliant generation, inclusive, tolerant, kind and hard-working. We should be proud of them. My question to you, John, is can we be proud of this government's response to the pandemic? Well, my attitude to, to that is that um, I think we all have to be ashamed uh, of the response of our government because it's our government and we elected it um, one way and another. We, we allowed this government to uh, win the election and so on. Um, the young people who um, Marie Harrison um, came across and were offering to help her are typical of what's been going on around the country. There have been tens of thousands of community groups have self-organised from early on in, in this, um, whether it's been around the parish council or the faith communities or just spontaneous groups like students offering to help. And it really does restore your faith in human nature. I mean, we've had over 30 years of this no such thing as society thing talking us all down as though the only thing that motivates people is selfishness. And, um, you know, I've found it profoundly depressing. I mean, my father um, died just before Margaret Thatcher won the election. And we were grateful really that he didn't live to see her become prime minister and all the things that followed afterwards because the thing that did it for him you know he was a type 1 diabetic who um, for whom the NHS was a godsend he was on insulin from 
1937. Um, and, the, you know, the NHS uh, enabled him to carry on a full life and work uh, more or less to retirement age and to bring up a family. But he, um, he took the, the, the thing when Margaret Thatcher, when she was Minister of Education and she stopped the school milk, and remember she was called Thatcher Milk Snatcher. Yeah. For him, this was a betrayal of everything that had been done by that wartime generation who, you know, came back, went through the hardships, had grown up in the hardships of the 30s, mm. been off to the war, had family and friends killed in the war and, uh, and all sorts of things, came back and were prepared to uh, accept the burden of taxation to build the welfare state and to ensure that their children had a better education than they had had and all the other things. And, you know, we've had all that uh, erosion of this community um, stuff. And I think what's been a light in this, in this present crisis is to see people pulling together. Yes, there have been instances of selfishness, there have been terrible failures at the national level mm. and self-indulgence from some people who are supposed to be leaders. Mm. Um, but one hopes uh, that um, when we come out of this, we'll be able to build on the selfless acts that have become so common during the last few months. Now, in 2014, you criticised what you called the moral bankruptcy of capitalism for being unwilling to deal with the Ebola epidemic, which was perceived as only a threat to poor people. You said the international community needed to address the conditions of squalor in which epidemics can thrive. In terms of the current pandemic in the UK, has inequality meant that poorer communities have been hardest hit? Yes, and we've seen in the last few days now that the statistics are being analysed um, systematically, uh, that poorer people, people on low income, uh, people living in poor conditions are much more likely to uh, experience uh, bad clinical outcomes from the uh, COVID uh, epidemic and to die from it. Um, this is really an indictment of our society. We were told this is we're all in this together, but clearly, um, you know, we're not. I mean, the people who are facing the public in quite um, ordinary jobs, but very important jobs like driving buses and taxis and interfacing in shops and in other places are being exposed to virus from the customers that they come into contact with. Um, and those of us who are fortunate to be able to work from home or have gardens and, you know, maybe drawing a salary without having to go out much are in a much better position. Mm. The, the original remarks which I made at, at that time in 2014 were because what had happened with Ebola is that the Ebola virus was discovered at the same time as the HIV virus in the 1980s. And with the HIV virus itself, which had originated uh, almost certainly in um, sub-Saharan Africa and had been running um, for some years before it came into Europe and to North America, uh, where it was seen as a gay disease initially. Yeah. But actually, it had been running as a heterosexual disease um, from the Congo down into southern Africa. Um, it was spread um, from poverty, from the urban encroachment into the jungle through slums and all of that, and people coming into contact with uh, wild animals and from the virus that was living in, in wild animal populations, and then was spread uh, down the truck routes uh, into the mining areas of southern Africa by sex workers who were, um, you know, the clients of um, truck drivers into south southern Africa. Yeah. Uh, there was no interest in, in developing a virus, uh, in, in developing um, a vaccine um, for Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no interest in developing a vaccine for gay men who were a stigmatised group. Yeah. Uh, and it was only when 
uh, HIV and AIDS started to affect babies and to affect uh, women and heterosexual people and then the scandal of in contaminated blood um, that there was the uh, impetus for the pharmaceutical industry the medical profession the politicians and everybody else to start getting interested in developing a vaccine the same thing was the case in 2014 we'd had um, known about the virus for 30 years uh, because it was affecting poor people in in um, the sub-Saharan part of Africa, there'd be no financial incentive or interest from the pharmaceutical companies in developing a vaccine. And this has been the history and the story of the pharmaceutical industry only interested in high margin products, only interested in research. It's, it applies to, to rare conditions. Uh, where it can be very difficult to get the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. to invest in producing treatments for people uh, who are suffering from things which are very rare because the profit and the uh, payments to the shareholders are paramount. Uh, and that's why we need a different type of pharmaceutical industry that works in partnership with governments and is driven by public health considerations. I remember well in the 80s a newspaper whose name I won't mention describing what they called the gay plague. Moving on, as a Liverpool FC supporter, you took the decision not to attend the home match with Madrid. Why did you do that? There were two reasons for this. Um, it, uh, that day I'd just returned from Bahrain where I've been advising the Bahrain government on the corona uh, epidemic um, and during the course of the day I started to worry about the game I started to worry about it personally um, I'm 72 I have type 2 diabetes so I'm a, at risk um, and I worried about it from the point of view of spread I'd been away for a few days and I'd just come back and was tuning into the discussion that was going on and I just thought this was madness. Uh, we, we knew that there was high levels of virus circulating in Madrid and that the football matches in Madrid were being closed, played behind closed doors. And yet we were, we were willing to contemplate three or 4,000 um, Madrid supporters coming and spending 24 hours on Merseyside where they would be out and about drinking in the bars, in the restaurants, in the hotels, and presumably at the souvenir shop at Anfield, as well as just sitting to watch the game. And this seemed to me to be reckless to allow that game to go ahead. So um, sadly, I think my wariness may well have proved um, accurate as we've seen the high levels of infection on Merseyside since. In 1981, Geoffrey Howe warned Mrs Thatcher not to overcommit scarce resources to Liverpool and argued, quote, I cannot help feeling that the option of managed decline is one which we should not forget altogether. We must not expend all our limited resources in trying to make water flow uphill. Do you think there are parallels between the way the government treated Merseyside back in 1981 and the way it is treating Merseyside now during the pandemic? Well, I think there are, but they're, but they're treating um, other parts of the country um, poorly as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we, we have this very highly centralised government into London and the South East, um, you know, the, the, you get the sense that no policy is really made with reference to what's going on outside the M25 yeah. motorway. Um, I know from my work and my world, something like 70% of the NHS research budget is spent in London and Oxford and Cambridge universities. Um, and that's quite typical of the way in which this country is organised. We've assets stripped those parts of the country that built the wealth uh, during the days of the colonies and the Commonwealth, um, you know, M Merseyside, uh, Manchester, the northern cities and towns, these were the engine rooms of the wealth of Victorian Britain. Um, and it's, it's a, a version of capitalism, uh, which I think is highly problematic. I think there are better forms of capitalism 
that have uh, objectives that are about social distribution and making sure nobody is left behind, mm. which we haven't got. We've got a very naked kind of exploitative capitalism mm. that that that, um, that, that uh, rapes um, communities, rapes resources, and then moves on to something new and leaves the leaves the mess behind for people to clean up. And that's what we had. We we had a situation there where they were prepared to abandon uh, Merseyside. Um, the, the, the talk was of de demolition of the Albert Dock and all of these things, which are jewels in the, in the city's architectural heritage. Mm. And um, what the legacy of that we're still living with, because during that period in the early 1980s, um, when so many uh, businesses, head offices, insurance companies and so on abandoned uh, Merseyside and the northwest, and went off down to the southeast and to the south coast. Uh, we had virtually 100% school leaver unemployment for those youngsters who weren't going to university and college, and, and we had that happening at the same time as heroin arrived on the streets, and we had an epidemic of uh, injecting heroin, and then we had HIV turned up, and fortunately we were able to do something about that in terms of in putting in place the first large-scale syringe exchange program in the world, mm. which kept the HIV vi virus out of that population. But the drug trade that built up at that time with this disaffected and alienated generation is what's fueled um, the gang warfare about drugs ever since. Mm. And uh, the police are still having to deal with that today. So, as a society, we're still having to deal with that. That's a legacy of those attitudes mm. of the 1980s towards our, our region. Yeah. John, the government plans to start a phased return to schools, starting with pupils in reception year one and year six. The mayor of Liverpool, Joe Anderson, says that he can't see schools returning until September and he will do all he can to stop the schools reopening in Liverpool. Do you think he's right? I think the prerequisite for slackening off the lockdown and for reopening the schools is to have very large scale testing and contact tracing and to make sure that the leakage of the virus from people becoming infected either as health and frontline workers in the hospitals or as frontline workers in the care homes or as frontline workers in the prisons uh, has to be sorted out with adequate personal protection before we do any of that. So I think Joe Anderson is right. Um, I think it's um, highly problematic for this generation. I think what we need to be doing is minimising the harm. I think we need to think seriously about whether we uh, write off this academic year um, and, and, and take the opportunity um, to reorganise our education so that the school year runs and the university year runs from January to December, where the, the, what we're living with now is actually from the medieval ages of the agricultural cycle and when you had to bring the harvest in. What we, what we could do with doing is saying, right, it's not fair on these kids who are going to be doing public exams, GCSE, A-levels and all the rest of it in, in 2021, uh, that we need to use this time differently uh, and let's uh, explore what, how we could do that, what resources we've got, can we take youngsters in groups uh, rotate them, take them out into the um, Lake District, into Snowdonia, into the field stations and places to be camping and walking in safety in groups, um, to be doing personal development, mm -hmm. to be doing other things, enabling them to grow up um, during this period of six, next six or nine months um, so that when they return to the curriculum, in January refreshed and with greater self-confidence from having had personal development opportunities, uh, they, they will have been protected and won't have put anybody else at risk. I think we need to be thinking laterally mm. about this situation and see it as an opportunity to do some of the things that people have talked about for a long time. It's time we could be developing that national service that people have spoken about where people can do social service for a few months or environmental service for a few months or yes, do some 
uh, something with the army or the air force or whatever but we could we could do that thing which brings together youngsters from different social backgrounds and begins to to overcome this problem of us having two parallel uh, societies of better off and and poorer people living separate lives um this is something we need a bit of vision we need some leadership um and we need to take the opportunity to do something different you've always been a keen supporter of the aims of the world health organization the government insists that it's following the science but it appears to be ignoring the who guidelines why is it important to have a coordinated international response to this pandemic the world health organization was set up after the war as one of the united nations bodies along with unesco and unicef and the international labor organization all those bodies that were intended to tackle the root causes of international conflict uh, leading to war and health is a big one of that of, of uh, the health disadvantage and epidemics collaboration when you have something like this pandemic is of absolutely of the essence people need to be working together between countries all around the world and following best practice for reasons which remain obscure at the moment we've been unwilling to follow uh, the practice which has been um, followed by other countries that have done much better than us in controlling this epidemic some of this seems to have been about this little englander mentality that emerged as part of the brexit debate mm. and the euphoria at the end of it uh, when they finally got the legislation through in january which may have stopped the government working together with the other european union countries to make sure we purchased together adequate personal protection um, but the other things that have been going on in, in other countries to do with testing, tracing, um, the approach to using modern technology to um, monitor people's movements when necessary and to uh, monitor temperatures and um, the well-being of children going to school. Some very good examples from, from China, from Taiwan, from South Korea, which we've just seemed very bloody minded about not following and it, it's embarrassing that we have this little England mentality. It's a failure of leadership and it's a failure of vision. John, since you've criticised that failure of vision, you've been subjected to a great deal of personal criticism in the press and on social media. If you don't mind me asking you, how have you dealt with that? Uh, well, it's been stressful, but, you know, I, I, you say a great deal. I have had um, subversion over the last month. There have been e efforts made to, to stop me from appearing on the BBC, complaints made, complaints made to my professional college about my behaviour. Um, I've been accused of anti-Semitism. Um, there's been some dirty tricks going on about, you know, trying to get me distracted uh, so that I didn't keep um, doing the work as I've been doing um, and that has been stressful but on the other hand I have phenomenal support uh, phenomenal support online not least from Merseyside and um, and friends and colleagues around the world and uh, I've got a very good family uh, network here and um, uh, you know uh, but it is stressful and um, there, there'll come a point where I need to recharge my batteries the Merseyside Pensioners Association, John, intends to fight for justice for all those who have died unnecessarily because of this government's response to the pandemic. You were present as a spectator at the football match in Hillsborough on the 15th of April 1989. You will know that eventually the truth came out about what actually happened there, despite a attempt at a cover-up by the press and the government. What information and research needs to be assembled to start uncovering the truth about this disaster? And in particular, what has happened to pensioners in, in this country? Well, 
there needs to be a community um, movement, um, certainly of the families that have lost uh, people in this epidemic and who feel that the uh, football match may have contributed to their uh, being infected. Um, you know, that as a parallel with the Hillsborough families, it's important that people should get together out of solidarity and to support each other and make sure there's a concerted voice. Um, the City of Liverpool has taken the initiative in commissioning research with the universities working together. It's a good example of the universities working together. And they will be doing the more academic aspect of collecting data, analysing it and looking to see whether it's possible to demonstrate clear connections between attendance at the match, being out and about in Liverpool during that 24 hours, or family connections and social connections to how people may have been infected, and linking that to those who became ill or who, who perished as a result. So that works underway, it needs supporting, uh, but the, uh, the, the solidarity which we saw, not just with Hillsborough, but we've seen with Grenfell as well, uh, where government has been callous and uh, not willing to reflect on its own contribution to the disaster, it's very important that that, that should take forward. And I, I would hope that the Pensioners Association could play an important role in facilitating that. When the lockdown is lifted and when it's safer as pensioners to meet again, we meet normally every week on a Wednesday, at Jack Jones House in Liverpool. I'm sure you'll be invited and you'll be on the guest list and we'll no doubt want to thank you for all the marvellous work that you've been doing in this field and you've got solidarity from pensioners, I'm sure, and people not just on Merseyside but from across the country and we wish you well. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Well, that's wonderful to hear, and it'd be a great privilege to meet uh, the members of, of the pensioners group. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm indebted today to listener Caroline Keane, whose stage name is Minnie. She contacted us saying that she loves the podcast and sent us a brilliant and original song she recorded a couple of years ago. Caroline is a good friend of Phil Newton, who is our resident pensioner musician. Take it away, Caroline. Let's change the world that we live in, baby. Why give in to the blues when we've a lifetime to choose our way? Let's try a new combination Now we know with nothing to lose Let's make our own headline news today We've seen how the media only favours the greedy In measuring a profit or loss We should be resorting to our own reporting Until we get the message across so let's make our own revolution Solutions nearly at hand Lovers are taking a stand at today Take it away, take it away, take it away That equality is no simple formality With millionaires and mansions and homes And for all the excuses We've seen how their uses Are just a load of charity balls So let's make our own revolution The solution's nearly at hand Lovers are taking a stand They've even brought a brass band 
lovers are taking a stand at today. Let's change the world that we live in. Sung there by Caroline Keane. Playing all the instruments there was her partner, Graham Casey. Well, the motto of the Merseyside Pensioners Association is fighting for pensioners and all who come after us. And Merseyside pensioners certainly fight to change the world that we live in. If Boris Johnson is listening, then Mr Johnson... I can assure you that Merseyside pensioners are very alert to the cull of pensioners that you have presided over. We are alert to the way you've been giving contracts out during this crisis to your mates and Tory party donors. We're alert to the unmitigated disaster you have brought down on this country and we will hold you to account for what you have done. I've been trying to get hold of Matt Hancock all week. I wanted to ask him why he thought that care homes have been adequately protected during the pandemic. They say persistence pays off. So to my amazement earlier this week, I got a call back from the Cabinet Office. Hello? Hi there, I'm calling back from the Cabinet Office, Press Office. Oh, hold on a second, let me just turn this music down. Sure, no problem. Thanks for calling back. Hi there. So, yeah, um, I understand you're looking uh, for a meeting with Matt Hancock. Is that the, the, the case? Well, we just want to do an interview over the phone. We're doing a podcast and so far we've interviewed Professor John Ashton and Merseyside MP Ian Byrne about the rising death toll amongst pensioners and right. uh, we've got a few questions we'd like to ask Mr Hancock. So um, as he's the Secretary of State for the Department for Health and Social Care you need to ask their press office so I will give you their details now if that's helpful. Sorry can you say that again? So um, as, as Matt Hancock is the Secretary of State for the Department for Health, yeah. you'd need to ask their press office. Um, so I can give you their contact details if you need. OK, yeah, that's great. If you could. So you can sort of put in a request. Um, uh, their email address is press office news desk, all one word. Yeah. At D H S C, um, as in the letters D H S C dot gov dot UK. I want to ask Matt Hancock why care homes have been left without testing, without contact tracing, without PPE, uh, because thousands of pensioners are witnesses to what has, has been going on, and we need answers. Do you have any idea when I'll get a, a reply to that? Because this podcast is going out this week and, you know, we've got some very serious questions to ask. Of course. Um, obviously, they'd have to let you know, uh, but of course, they'll sort of, you know, handle it, um, handle the request with urgency. But, you know, um, given sort of ministerial diaries and, and, and things, they'll look into it as, as, as fast as they can. OK, well, thanks for your help. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, I'm still waiting for the interview with Mr Hancock. I really don't understand why he doesn't want to talk to me. I might have to go into therapy if he keeps ignoring me. One politician who's not shy is the MP for West Derby, Ian Byrne. You, Dave Kelly and Robert Daniels set up fans supporting food banks and you've been collecting food for those who need it at Liverpool and Everton matches for a long time. Can you tell us about how the food bank has been operating during the pandemic? I, I also believe at the same time the group has created a Merseyside Personal Protective Equipment Partnership which is making vital PPE. So how was that established? So the food bank has been operating during the uh, pandemic remotely, if I'm honest. It's, so obviously, 
So with the football obviously being suspended, we had to uh, we had to think quick on our feet, to be honest. Yeah. And ensure that we had the ability to keep the stocks uh, full. So we said we're just giving Paige. I got one hundred and forty thousand pound yeah. about six weeks ago. But when we were doing that, we also uh, wanted to create a hub to ensure that we could make the parcels, which were uh, which were going going to be delivered to the food banks. And that's been going really successfully for the last six weeks. They've been getting uh, constructed in in uh, Anfield Community Centre, uh, which is actually in the West Derby constituency. Uh, and and from there, there's just hundreds, if not thousands, of parcels have gone across across the city to be distributed to uh, trust, and trust food banks. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the system of food banks, as we knew it, which was a voucher system. Had to change because a lot of the food banks were there were, were obviously closing down because a lot of the people that run them were actually at risk. Yeah. Uh, so they had to go into isolation. So we had to change quite quickly to an e voucher system mm. and home delivery. And that's gone unbelievably well considering we had to change the entire process with the North Liverpool food banks. And, and that, as I said, that's been, I hate to say it, but it's been a success. We've had to, you know, it's, as I say, thousands of parcels have gone out uh, to families across the city, uh, hundreds a week. And it's, you know, it's done what I'd have to do, which we're, which we're pleased about, Phil. And obviously we had that money being fenced for food, which had been donated by Liverpool Football Club, normal fans, just basically right across the city, ever made donations. So it's been a, it's been a lovely collective effort. As usual, with their fan support and food banks, and everyone's uh, stood up to the plate. Now the PPE side was was uh, a phone call that was already happening in the city. So Days High School uh, had been furloughed, and they decided to uh, start making uh, PPE visors on the laser cutter. And they got in touch with us about five weeks ago now and said, "Is there anything we can?" you can do to help us. So we said, well, let's pull it together because we knew there's a lot of people throughout the city that were doing this. And we just thought if we, if we created a central hub where people could actually go and deposit what they were doing because real cottage didn't just leave them on us, Phil. There's people doing it in the houses with 3D printers. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, real, real communal effort, which, which has been great on a number of fronts. So we thought we created, we created the hub, agreed, called it the L, 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 LT PPE hub, uh, working with the likes of Dave Coffey, who owns a couple of franchises in uh, Liverpool for Costa. Mm. He's fair all his staff and he's used the time to create visors. So we've got about, I think it's about 20, 25 schools signed up. So they, by their fair load and shut down, they're using the they, uh, capabilities within the school to, to create the visors. I think we're up to about 30,000 visors now which have been created and distributed across the city and that's to hospitals, frontline workers and care homes and hospitals. But also, you know, mentally it's a really good uh, tool keep people engaged and positive during, uh, during the crisis and when you've seen them come in a, a team, it's, it's, it's really, it, you know, it's really awe-inspiring what, what, what has been done. You know, Liverpool have got a habit of doing this and, you know, that is right across the nation but, you know, I'm extremely proud of the whole and fans of Bolton Food Banks are extremely proud of, of the efforts of, uh, of what we've done and, you know, it is a, a promotion of working class solidarity mm-hmm. uh, between fan groups and, you know, I think me, Davey and Robbie have never been more proud of when we see both Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, West Ham, Newcastle, Othersfield, all, all coming together uh, for the common good. Well, that sounds amazing. So talking about post-Covid, earlier on I spoke to Professor John Ashton about the reasons why he didn't go to the Liverpool home match with Madrid. As I'm sure you already know, the impact of the virus is still far higher in Liverpool than in other parts of the country. As well as being incredibly critical of the government's response, he said that we needed to hold the government to account for unnecessary deaths. Do you agree with him? I backed uh, Professor Aston from the get-go on this. Uh, you know, I was quite vocal in my support for him and he was trying to get castigated as it, uh, as, you know, as it... As a, as, a, as a lone wolf and someone that didn't have the, you know, didn't have the authority to speak like he did. And he's been right from the outset, and we've seen that from, from BBC Question Time, and I think he's called it called it right. So 
the game should have gone ahead. We made the dereliction of duty by the government. They just didn't take it seriously enough. And that's it. I, I think that was a shameful. So you've actually called, haven't you, for an independent inquiry when this is all over into the way the government has handled the pandemic. What What's the idea behind that? Well, I think you have to be an independent inquiry, Phil, to, to find out how it was handled and, you know, what's, what's went wrong, because yeah. obviously it has. And, you know, lessons have always got to be learned, haven't they? And I think this is it fundamentally important that an inquiry takes place. Finally, Ian, this awful uh, Tory government is planning a phased return of pupils to school, starting with pupils in reception year one and also year six. The teaching unions want the government to step back from the plan. And Joe Anderson has been very vociferous about this. And he said, quote, we have the power to stop schools reopening and we'll use it if necessary. Do you agree with him? Hundred percent. I think the uh, I think the teachers' unions have been uh, fantastic. I think the five tests, uh, what they've asked, what they've set out, uh, is the right way forward. I think it's a fair number of tests to ensure the safety of the pupils, the teachers, and also the families. And absolutely appalled to see what the Daily Mail wrote today, basically trying to divide frontline workers, the country, and castigate teachers, you know, as, as cowards. Mm. Look, we all want to get back to normality. I've got three children, one in university. I'd love them to be back in school. Mm. Until there's a proper procedures in place, as set out by the five tests, but then we can't go back, yeah. and that's it. As I said, I'm fully behind the trade union movement on this one. Just when you thought the government's conduct could sink no lower, they always managed to rise to the occasion. A new scheme, unveiled recently by Education Secretary Gavin Williamson, will allow schools to issue electronic gift cards or vouchers worth £15 a week per child to spend at supermarkets. But the small print of Williamson's guidance makes it clear that the policy of universal free meals for all under eights, those in reception class, year one and year two, will not apply during the COVID-19 outbreak. And with nearly a million more people applying for universal credit because of lost income during the crisis, Many of their children are set to miss out if they earn more than £7,400 a year after tax. So the policy is to send the kids back to school and make sure they are hungry. Unsurprisingly, war criminal Tony Blair supports the government's return to school policy. He said the government was adhering to scientific advice by preparing schools to open their doors again. I suppose that must be the advice from Chief Scientist Advisor Dominic Cummings. Mr Blair said, quote, They're right, I think, to be reopening the schools. You can listen to all of the Merseyside Pensioners podcasts by going to the Merseyside Pensioners YouTube channel. There's also some films you can watch featuring the campaigning work of the Merseyside Pensioners Association. You can also hear us each week on Liverpool Community Radio FM 106.7 or online. Remember, if you have something to say, then contact me by email at maxwellphotouk at yahoo.co.uk. Thanks for all of your emails. Keep them coming. Our regular listener Mark Holt sent in the following email, which I thought you should hear. He says, We are being propagandised at like never before. The world's big media has become a one-track pony. First, it was Brexit breakfast, which we never heard the end of, and now it's coronavirus. 
Believe it or not, COVID-19 is not the only threat to our planet as we still have melting ice caps and a climate that's out of control. Right now, precisely because of the economic fallout caused by the virus, around the world, 250 million people are in imminent danger of starvation. But it doesn't have to be like that. Believe it or not, we could have a choice. The world is once more at a juncture. Boris Johnson and his mate Trump and their lobbyists are working round the clock to persuade finance ministers to revive pre-virus capitalism and back business as usual. But was that world really any good when half our country's peoples lived on the breadline? Why couldn't we re-nationalise our health service and implement some of Corbyn's economic plan. The voracious big business corporate model relies on trashing our rainforests, oceans and insect populations and we need to wake up to this fact. It's economic fascism. Food for thought there from our listener Mark Holt. Last but not least... Our final guest for today is Merseyside pensioner Audrey White. Audrey, pensioners who survived this pandemic will no doubt want truth and justice to prevail. How can that be achieved? You know, this government, um, it has known what to do. And they haven't protected, particularly the elderly. You know, and we are the Merseyside Pensioners Association. We're trying to speak on behalf of uh, vulnerable um, people who are now, we've learned, 34 times more likely to die. And what gets me, Bill, is that it's happening now. We can't talk about it as if it's something in the past. We're in the eye of the storm. Yeah. are still dying at an are absolutely horrendous race. The first responsibility of government is to protect the population. And our government, through its negligence, has failed to do that. We've got to find a way, perhaps through the trade union and labour movement, perhaps through the law courts, maybe there's an arguable case to make this government um, personally, some of them personally, and I would name um, Boris Johnson, and um, and our, the health minister, um, you know, to actually be, be held personally responsible for their failings because we can't allow this to continue. And one of the really, I just want to finish on this point, but one of the really important things that John uh, Ashton raised, and it's funny because we've raised it uh, in the uh, Pensioners Association ourselves a number of times, we have a national health service. It's costly. It's being privatised day by day by day. Um, but the one aspect of our health is the pharmaceutical industry. We make massive profits from the, our health service. And he's outlined just what's wrong with that because they will not pursue, they will not look for drugs, vaccinations and so on unless there's high profit margins. You know, and that their service is in the service of shareholders, which is, you know, the fault, which is the fault of them, um, of allowing that pharmaceutical industry to remain in the hands of profiteers. And we really must make sure that in the long term, we do nationalise the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry in the interest of society. But more than anything, we need some we need some leadership to make sure that we can take on this government uh, because as they if they carry on every single day, they are continuing to kill us. Great talking to you, Audrey. No doubt this discussion will continue over the coming weeks and months, and I know that the Merseyside Pensioners Association will not let this go. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Remember, you are not on your own. We are stronger together because we understand the meaning of solidarity. Until next time, stay safe. And I leave you with these words from the late Tony Benn. 
Well, I mean, I do a diary every night, and I must admit, at night I do allow my gloom to penetrate, but I edit it out when I publish, because, you see, um, pessimism is a prison into which you put yourself. Optimism is a fuel that makes you want to uh, join in, and that's why that phrase, another world is possible, is so important. It raised people's hopes. And in every generation, in every country, there have been two flames burning. The flame of anger against injustice and the flame of hope you could build a better world. But I must add to that, every generation has to fight the same battles again and again. There is no railway station called socialism, and if only you could get Bob Crow to drive you there, you'd get there. It's an illusion, not that he says that, but uh, uh, you have to go on and on and on and on. And that's why history is so important because it tells you where it went wrong. Mm -hmm.